Welcome. This is the first of uh, four videos we're going to do talking about one-factor experiments. Although most of the semester we'll spend our time talking about and analyzing experiments with multiple factors, it's helpful in terms of understanding uh, experimental design concepts uh, and analysis if we begin with some simple one-factor um, examples. So I'm going to go ahead and put my PowerPoint on slideshow. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and select a pointing device. Okay. And we'll begin the discussion. So as I said, uh, I'm assuming at this point that uh, everyone has exper experience um, with statistics. You've gone through the introductory statistics materials. And I will ask you to read through the notes on the history of design of experiments. It really began with uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, who is considered the, actually the, probably the founder of modern statistics. If you want to learn about him, there's a very interesting novel-like uh, book in terms of style called The Lady Tasting Tea. It talks about him and his impact on science in the 20th century. And through design of experiments and analysis, uh, he has had a profound effect on how scientists experiment and analyze data. But if you read through the book, you'll find out that Fisher be, began to develop methodology for experimentation, uh, working with uh, scientists at an agricultural experiment station. Again, I'll leave it to you to read through the notes uh, and the details of it. And in these um, experiments, he laid out four basic principles of experimentation. Uh, what we call replication, randomization, blocking, we'll talk about that later in the course, in factorial experimentation, and he also developed what we now know as analysis of variance or ANOVA, which I uh, will give some explanation of later on, assuming most of you probably have had little exposure to ANOVA. Okay. And I just wanted to talk briefly about replication. What does that actually mean? Replication is nothing more than repeating some or possibly all of the trials in the experiment in some random order. And the idea of replication is that you redo the experiment under the same conditions. And any variation that you see in your response is thought of as noise. So without replication, we have no idea how much noise or natural variation the response exhibits. In other words, the replication allows us to understand how much a response randomly varies by itself. That is, if we intervene in no way and just watch the process, how much variation occurs. And unless we know something about the fundamental noise in the system, then it's very difficult to tell whether or not we've actually changed the response by manipulating our experimental factors, or are we simply observing random changes. In fact, many published research articles where the results can't be reproduced can be traced back to the fact that the experimenters failed to replicate. That is, they did some experimentation until they got a result they like, published it without knowing that that result was purely random, and they really had not observed a true phenomena. Okay. Another principle that we'll observe is randomization. The idea of randomization is that we do the trials in a random order. In other words, uh, for instance, you generate a design in JUMP. As we'll do later, JUMP will give you the design in a random order. And the idea of randomization is that there are almost always 
hidden or lurking variables in the experimental environment that we do not know about. So if we take our trials and we randomize them, we may not eliminate the noise caused by these lurking variables, but we've at least randomized out the effect so that we will not confuse or confound the variation caused by our experimental factors with variation that could be had, um, caused by these hidden or uh, nuisance or sometimes we call them lurking variables. Okay. Blocking again I'll talk about later on so I'm going to pass by it. And one of the really important contributions of Fisher was factorial experimentation. And all we mean by the term factorial experimentation is that we have multiple factors, each with two or more levels, and we do all possible combinations in some random order. Okay? And the reason for this is that often factors interact. This was an important insight that Fisher had. In other words, up until Fisher, it was commonly assumed that if you studied each factor by itself, that is, I have multiple, say, inputs to a system or process, if I hold uh, most of the factors constant and change one at a time, then I can evaluate how each individual factor behaves, and then I can just add the effects together, and now I'll know how the system behaves. This sort of assumes that, that these factors each acts independently and their effects are additive. Well, it turns out this is simply not true. In fact, this goes back to the uh, 18th, well, the 1800s, really, where in the philosophy of science they had a reductionist principle which truly believed that if you isolated each input to a system and studied it, then the effects would collectively add and you'd know everything you needed to know about the system. Well, it turns out that's really not at all how <coughs> actual systems behave. What happens is typically these factors act together. And the term we use in design of experiments is we say they interact. So how a factor influences a response indeed actually depends upon the settings of other factors. That's why if you change one thing at a time and hold other factors constant, you'll often be very much misled as to how these factors actually behave together. So I'm going to illustrate this with a simple example. Let's say we have two factors, A and B, and each of these factors is at two levels. And you'll notice on slide 11 at the bottom is a simple data table. Okay? And there's a total of 12 runs because we replicated uh, each of the settings three times. Okay. Well, notice on slide 12 something we'll, we'll learn to like and to use called the prediction profiler in jump. Notice what's going on. So I'm gonna, again, I'll make sure I have the right pointing device. Notice on the left hand side factor A is set at 1. Okay, What you're seeing is a profile that tells you how that factor is influencing the response. So at plus uh, 1, the flat line indicates A on average is having no effect on the response. But notice the effect of B. The line slopes up. This indicates as B increases, the response Y increases. Now look to the right. I've shifted A to its low level of minus 1. But now look at the effect of B. It's reversed. Now, as B increases, the response decreases. In other words, the relationship of B to the response Y is completely flipped. This is very common behavior, 
And this is why we could not in this system study A by itself or B by itself. We really would be misled because how B behaves depends upon the settings of A and vice versa. So the ability to study interactions is one of the primary reasons why most of the semester will use factorial experiments and we will strongly discourage the use of one factor at a time experimentation. Okay. Now we mentioned randomization. That is, it's pretty simple. We just have some set of trials and we do them in some random order. And these are sometimes referred to as completely randomized designs or simply CRDs. Okay. Pretty simple to deal with. And in this case, again, all uh, runs are done in a random order. Uh, later, we'll talk about cases where we don't completely randomize. One of those is when involves something called blocking. Again, I'll put that discussion off until we get to it. And the other is something called split plots, which we'll talk about near the end of the course. These are exceptions to the rule of completely randomizing a design. For the meantime, we're going to keep things simple. We're going to study experiments where we just randomly vary uh, various <coughs> factors uh, and settings. Okay. And as we go forward, there's an important concept. It, this is often a bit confusing at first, but it is important. This is called the experimental unit, or simply EU. By definition, it's the smallest entity or quantity to which you applied in experimental treatment. And I use an example. Suppose you're experimenting with a process to synthesize a polymer and you have some number of factors you want to change, like temperatures, pressures, feed rates, stirring, and so forth. So we do a factorial experiment for, so for each run. Okay, you set up the equipment uh, according to the settings you want, and you produce some batch of polymer under those conditions that batch of polymer would be called the experimental unit. It's the smallest entity to which you applied the treatment. And of course, then we change the settings and uh, run another uh, batch. That batch would be an, uh, an EU for different settings. So try to keep this straight. That, and, I'll, and I'll mention it again as we go along in the course. And you'll see later on uh, it's important in doing the correct analysis. So become used to the idea of the EU. Don't complicate it. It is simply the smallest entity on which we did the experiment. That is the entity to which we applied the treatments. Okay. So I'm going to begin with a simple example and uh, actually introduce how to analyze the experiment uh, in JUMP. And this is a really simple experiment, and it's easy to understand. That's why I like to use it. So food scientists are looking at four ways to package meat for sale, say, in a grocery store. So they're looking at commercial plastic wrap. You're all familiar with that if you've been in a grocery store. Vacuum sealed. Again, you'd be familiar with that. It's typically uh, sold in grocery stores. Another packaging method where they inject a mixed gas environment. And finally, a fourth packaging method where the, uh, they seal the package injected with CO2. Okay. So they have 12 um, settings uh, in the experiment because they have four levels of the factor packaging. So packaging is the experimental method, has four levels. And then they have three replicate stakes to which they apply the methods. Okay. So each uh, level has three replicates.
that gives us a total of 12 trials in the experiment and the primary response is log bacterial count per square centimeter after the stakes have been stored in the packaging method for a period of nine days. So in this case, the experimental unit is a stake. That's the smallest thing you packaged. Okay. So there are some other questions there. Um, and uh, it's not important you answer them now, but in doing an experiment, one of the things you should think about are what are possible effects that we haven't controlled for that might be important. Okay. So I'm not going to answer the questions. They're there more as thought questions. But as part of designing experiment, we're always thinking about and looking for sources of variation that we need to control for. Okay. So if you take a look at the results, okay, and we show these on slide 17. Again, remember these are log counts. Okay, so don't be uh, you know don't be fooled by the magnitude. So notice we have three replicate measurements. Okay, for each of our methods. And the variation within the packaging, each packaging method is considered noise, or Fisher would call it experimental error. We don't know why all three stakes don't result in exactly the same response, but that is the physical reality of the world that you'll work in as a professional scientist or engineer. Okay, we're going to start by trying to relate packaging method to the response, which is log counts, using a very simple linear model. Okay, and you'll see this uh, a number of times uh, throughout the notes. So the response, y sub i j, i is the treatment level. So here it is which packaging method. And j is the particular replicate for each method. Okay, so yij is one trial of the experiment. Mu, okay, and you look at mu, is just the overall mean. That is, what's the overall grand average of the response, okay, which would be some level. And these little Greek letter taus, all they represent are shifts in the overall mean that could be caused by each of the packaging methods. Okay, so mu plus tau i would give you the overall mean level for the ith packaging level, okay, whatever that might be. And then finally, we add on this little epsilon sub i j, and that's there for theoretical reasons, and what it represents is error, or experimental uh, error is a better way to put it, or noise. So for the jth replicate, of the ith treatment level, when we measure the response associated with it, there will always be some noise or random error. And the epsilons are there to represent the random error and remind us that the responses we measure are random and they have distributions. What we're trying to estimate in this experiment is what is the mean response for each of the packaging methods and are those means possibly different. Okay, So this is the analysis done in the JUMP software and I'm going to go to it in a moment. Okay. So the overall grand average is 5.9 and then notice that the taus are measured as shifts from the grand average to each of the treatment averages. So for CO2, okay, the average response is minus 2.54 units below the grand average. Okay. For commercial rep, the average response is 1.58 units above the response and so forth. Okay. So what you're seeing are the taus. So those are the taus, and the grand average okay, represents mu. 
Now notice that we're measuring these experimental effects with respect to the grand average. Therefore, we have this interesting and actually very useful result that if you add up all the tau's, they sum to zero. This may not seem intuitive to you when you first look at it, but what it, what it actually means is since we're measuring shifts up or down away from the grand average over all the treatments, they have to sum to zero because they're changes about the average. Okay? And that is actually a very important point. Okay. Again, we'll see this, uh, this idea of these tiles and sum to zero later on in a later section. So basically, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're testing. So under a null hypothesis, there, there are no uh, real differences in average response between the treatment levels. What we're actually assuming is that all levels have exactly the same mean, which equivalently says all of the tau's are zeros. Okay, and how we determine if this hypothesis is uh, possibly true or possibly invalid is through analysis, and this is typically done through analysis of variance. Okay, so. Basically, uh, what we're going to do next is discuss the principles of analysis of variance and show how it works. What I'd like to do first, though, is to quickly show you, there we go, how we do an analysis um, of a one-factor experiment in jump. So I'm going to bring over a table, and this contains um, the meat packaging data. And basically, we're comparing the response column log counts to the experimental factor uh, column treatment. So if you compare two columns in jump, that takes you to fit y by x. Okay. So log counts is the measured response. And then the treatment factor, uh, or x, basically is what we call treatment or whatever names you've picked for the variables. So this is, uh, we fill out the launch window or dialog, click OK, and we get a scatter plot. Again, uh, you can see the variation uh, within each group, and this variation represents noise. Okay. So that tells you how much these responses vary on their own. How much random variation exists uh, stake to stake in log bacteria count uh, when observed under the same conditions. So to do an analysis, we do ANOVA. And under the red arrow, that's actually your second object. Um, yes, it would be the second option, ANOVA. And you get an ANOVA table. And I'm going to go through the interpretation of it. But basically, if you've had some introduction to statistics, treatment is the variation um, between the levels of packaging. So that's a measure of how much effect the uh, packaging methods have. Okay. And then error is a measure of noise. And that's actually calculated from the replicates within each group. And then finally, we do what's called an F-test or F-ratio. And a very small p-value indicates that there are significant differences in average response between the packaging methods. So there really must be differences, uh, real differences in packaging method in terms of bacteria growth. And then you're given a table. Uh, which we'll look at off and on, okay, which gives you uh, some statistics on the group averages. OK, so that completes our first introductory discussion on one-factor experiments.